Great to have all of you here today. And um, we're on chapter 18, section seven, I need do nothing. So I'm gonna share my screen in a minute and then we'll be able to discuss uh, afterwards. And uh, we've had some good conversations so far this morning about codependency and some of our early skills that kept us safe that are now maladaptive and not working so well in our lives. Uh, but we will, I'm sure, be getting all kinds of information when we read this first section that will have everything to do with what we've been talking about for the last half an hour. <laughs> so let me go ahead and share my screen and get into this next section here. I need do nothing. <clears throat> you still have too much faith in the body as a sor source of strength. What plans do you make that do not involve its comfort or protection or enjoyment in some way? This makes the body an end and not a means in your interpretation. And this always means you still find sin attractive. No one accepts at one mint for himself who still accepts sin as his goal. You have thus not met your one responsibility. At one mint is not welcomed by those who prefer pain and destruction. There's one thing that you have never done. You have not utterly forgotten the body. It has perhaps faded at times from your sight, but it has not yet completely disappeared. You are not asked to let this happen for more than an instant. Yet it is in this instant that the miracle of at one mint happens. Afterwards, you will see the body again, but never quite the same. And every instant that you spend without awareness of it gives you a different view of it when you return. At no single instant does the body exist at all. It is always remembered or anticipated, but never experienced just now. Only its past and future make it seem real. Time controls it entirely for sin is never wholly in the present. In any single instant, the attraction of guilt would be experienced as pain and nothing else and would be avoided. It has no attraction now. Its whole attraction is imaginary and therefore must be thought of in the past or in the future. It is impossible to accept the holy instant without reservation unless just for an instant, you are willing to see no past or future. You cannot prepare for it without placing it in the future. Release is given you the instant you desire it. Many have spent a lifetime in preparation and have indeed achieved their instance of success. This course does not attempt to teach more than they learned in time, but it does aim at saving time. You may be attempting to follow a very long road to the goal you have accepted. It is extremely difficult to reach at one mint by fighting against sin. Enormous effort is expended in the attempt to make holy what is hated and despised. Nor is a lifetime of contemplation and long periods of meditation aimed at detachment from the body necessary. All such attempts will ultimately succeed because of their purpose. Yet the means are tedious and very time consuming for all of them look to the future for release from a state of present unworthiness and inadequacy. Your way will be different, not in purpose, but in means. A holy relationship is a means of saving time. One instant spent together with your brother restores the universe to both of you. You are prepared. Now you need but to remember, you need do nothing. It would be far more profitable now merely to concentrate on this than to consider what you should do. When peace comes at last to those who wrestle with temptation and fight against the giving into sin, when the light comes at last into the mind given to contemplation, or when the goal is finally achieved by anyone, it always comes with just one happy realization. I need do nothing. Here, 
is the ultimate release, which everyone will one day find in his own way at his own time. You do not need this time. Time has been saved for you because you and your brother are together. This is the special means this course is using to save you time. You are not making use of this course if you insist on using means which have served others well, neglecting what was made for you. Save time for me by only this one preparation and practice doing nothing else. I need do nothing is a statement of allegiance, a truly undivided loyalty. Believe it for just one instant and you will accomplish more than is given to a century of contemplation or of struggle against temptation. To do anything involves the body. And if you recognize you need do nothing, you have withdrawn the body's value from your mind. Here is the quick and open door through which you slip past centuries of effort and escape from time. This is the way in which sin loses all attraction right now. For here is time denied and past and future gone. Who needs do nothing has no need for time. To do nothing is to rest and make a place within you where the activity of the body ceases to demand attention. Into this place, the Holy Spirit comes and there abides. He will remain when you forget and the body's activities return to occupy your conscious mind. Yet there will always be this place of rest to which you can return. And you will be more aware of this quiet center of the storm than all its raging activity. This quiet center in which you do nothing will remain with you, giving you rest in the midst of every busy doing on which you are sent. For from this center, you will be directed how to use the body sinlessly. It is this center from which the body is absent that will keep it so in your awareness of it. Yeah, I really like that because it allows for when you, first of all, when the little self doesn't have to control everything or be busy doing it, it allows for a space, like that paragraph says, it allows for the space of hearing the truth, of letting that set in and knowing that as a whole, then you can interact with whatever it is. But the little self doesn't have to jump in anticipating what's going to happen, fix the problem, come out the ta-da, or come out lesser than because it didn't work out. And then all the tapes that we tell ourselves come into play, I'm, I'm not worthy, I screwed up, I blah, blah, blah. all that disappears in that moment of just being open to and rest, knowing that basically the problem's already handled and you don't even perceive it as a problem in the first place. It's just another experience that's handled in the whole, but you can engage in it and enjoy it, if you will. It's there for, for that part of the experience and none other, but it's in that, in that pause, in the space, for me, is where God is. In the space between objects, in the pause between speech, in the silence, if you will. But in that space is where the connection is. Thank you, Mary. That was, that was a good point. This um, always reminds me of, and I know I'm, I'm sorry for the people who've heard this story so many times, <laughs> but this reminds me of when I was um, having a, a problem with communication with the father of my children. And we had agreed that we were going to be friends. And, you know, it was like that sacrifice that I was making that, okay, I, I don't care about child support. I don't care about anything. I just want to make sure that we're always friends so that the kids are all right. You know, my biggest concern was I want the kids to be okay. I want them to have 
loving, supportive parents, even if we're not married. And I want us to always give them that safe place to go. Well, then he had a girlfriend who wasn't on board with that. And in the past, we'd spent holidays together. We'd gotten together for the kids' birthday parties at his parents' house, at my house. We'd gotten together for, for everything. And we were just like literally just friends. Neither of us had any interest in going beyond that. But this girlfriend like just wouldn't have it. She like laid down the law and she's like, from now on, there's gonna be separate birthday parties. From now on, there's gonna be separate holidays. From now on, there's no gonna be, I don't want you talking to her anymore. I mean, it, it got to the point where my son was in chorus and we would go to the recitals and we'd all be together. And I was like the invisible woman. And we'd be standing in a circle and they wouldn't acknowledge me. They wouldn't look at me. They would talk to the kids. And it, it was just such an awkward, weird, horrible energy feeling. And, you know, I tried everything like we talked about earlier, people pleasing, you know, what can I do to make her feel better? What can I make her, what, to, what can I do to make her not feel threatened? And the nicer I was and the more I tried to please her, the, the angrier she got. And it got to the point then she was trying to get his family did not talk to me, like their grandparents, their aunt, you know, that was his family, you know, they, they were told, don't speak to her, don't talk to her anymore, don't have a relationship. And, you know, his, his mother was like, forget this, you know, I know, I know what happens if I don't have a relationship with her, I'm not going to see my grandchildren anymore. So the mother was not on board. Um, but it was just this huge turmoil. And I just, I was so frustrated because I thought, oh my gosh, I have done everything. And I remember driving to Atzeningo Park to go for a run because there's this nice trail by the water that I like to run on. And I remember putting my sneakers on and tears were coming out of my eyes because I was so upset by this whole situation. And because I was afraid for my kids, that was my main concern was like, this is really hurting my children. It's not fair. You know, I never took anything from him for child support or anything. And now like he's violating this trust in this agreement that we had. And I, I did the um, lesson 365 because I, I had nothing else. I tried everything. It's holy and sin I give to you. Be you in charge for I shall follow you. Certainly your direction will bring me peace. And I let it go, like completely let it go. Put on my shoes and I just started running. Didn't think about it again. And I would say once I started getting into that like runners kind of trance where my mind just opened up, I heard in my voice, you need do nothing. And it was like, wow, that's the only thing I haven't tried. <laughs> I have tried everything else to fix this. I need to do nothing. <sighs> like it was like, the weight of the world just was lifted off my shoulders. It's like, this has nothing to do with you. You need to do nothing. And all of a sudden I realized that now even my interaction with my children was better because I didn't have this like anger of what he was doing or she was doing or this frustration. It like cleared up so much energy in my world for things to just run more smoothly I had to just completely let go of it, have no expectations, not try to fix it, solve it or whatever. And within six months, they broke up. <laughs> so it was, it kind of took care of itself, but it's, it's just so interesting, you know, such a simple thing. You need to do nothing. All right. Does anybody else have anything they want to share with this? Oh, I just wanted to just say a little funny. Yeah, you don't want to be lazy. You don't want to be irresponsible. I mean, you're just sitting around <laughs> accepting uh, accepting the solution. The um, what would it be? The, the the discontinuation of the madness. <laughs> you know, you're. You're just not giving any power to all that. And everybody's going, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but we got to argue. We got to scream. We got to yell. We got to have fights, whatever. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying you did that, Jerry, but that's what the ego screams for. Like, I've got all these projects, you know, I get up every morning like, oh, I got to do that. I gotta, you know, I'm way behind. I get anything done. <laughs> you know, so what? I've said it before, you know, in 50 years, this 
house will be torn down or whatever, you know, I mean, God, all this stuff. And so we leave that legacy to our kids that, oh, you got to work, 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 you know, and then they don't feel right because, well, God, nobody can work two jobs like dad did most of his life. No, 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 you know, so I'm, you know, I'm leaving a legacy of basically hell if I don't explain that to the, the kids and those that are around me that are close. So, you know, yeah, you got to eat and all that kind of stuff, but, you know, I don't think you're going to starve to death. You know? <laughs> There's there's food kitchens, et cetera. <laughs> I think food has a way, hunger has a way of motivating you at least to a minimum amount. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to make an exaggerated uh, example, um, but it's the space, like Mary was saying, it's the space between the thoughts, um, between the, the needing to do or the desire to do or whatever it's that just leave it all alone just accept what is is and there's really not a whole lot you can do to change it not, not with a, a, a overwhelming amount of effort and then probably nothing <laughs> look at what countries do I love the part of this too, where it says, forget the body just for an instant. If you can just forget the body for an instant, it'll never look the same again. Has anybody here done that? I know Ernesto, yeah. you wanted to say something too. So I don't want to, I don't want to not give you some time to talk. Well, that was the, the line, line seven and paragraph seven is because, you know, for me to do nothing, that kind of rubs me the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> I like to think that, you know, wait a minute, no, no, I got to do something. <laughs> But right. <laughs> this line is what what references to me to, to this, what it's finally saying. You know, I've read this many times. Never did I hear this sentence. It says, to do nothing is to rest and make a place within you where the activity of the body ceases to demand attention. Yeah. yeah. That's all it is. That's mm. it. You know, because there, and then following up on paragraph eight, line three says, the quiet center in which you do nothing will remain with you, giving you rest in the midst of every busy doing on which you are sent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, boy, that speaks volumes there. Yeah, it does. And from and from this center, you are you will be directed how to use the body sinlessly. Yeah. Of course, that word seamlessly, you know, it's 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 with, with abandonment, I guess, is how I would, what I would say. Right. As a means of communication, probably, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good. Excellent. Anyone else before we go to the next section? Okay. The Little Garden. <clears throat> it is only the awareness of the body that makes love seem limited, for the body is a limit on love. The belief in limited love was its origin, and it was made to limit the unlimited. Think not that this is merely allegorical, for it was made to limit you. Can you see, can you who see yourself within a body know yourself as an idea? Everything you recognize, you identify with the externals, something outside itself. You cannot even think of God without a body or in some form you think you recognize. The body cannot know. And while you limit your awareness to its tiny senses, you will not see the grandeur that surrounds you. God cannot come into a body, nor can you join him there. Limits on love will always seem to shut him out and keep you apart from him. The body is a tiny fence around a little part of a glorious and complete idea. It draws a circle infinitely small around a very little segment of heaven 
splintered from the whole, proclaiming that within it is your kingdom, where God cannot enter. Within this, king, within this kingdom, the ego rules, and cruelly. And to defend this little speck of dust, it bids you fight against the universe. This fragment of your mind is such a tiny part of it that could you but appreciate the whole, you would see instantly that it is like the smallest sunbeam to the sun or like the faintest ripple on the surface of the ocean. In its amazing arrogance, this tiny sunbeam has decided it is the sun. This almost imperceptible ripple hails itself as the ocean. Think how alone and frightened this little thought is, this infinitesimal illusion holding itself apart against the universe. The sun becomes the sunbeam's enemy that would devour it. And the ocean terrifies the little ripple and wants to swallow it. Yet neither sun nor ocean is even aware of all this strange and meaningless activity. They merely continue unaware that they are feared and hated by a tiny segment of themselves. Even that segment is not lost to them for it could not survive apart from them. And what it thinks it is in no way changes its total dependence on them for its being. Its whole existence still remains in them. Without the sun, the sunbeam would be gone. The ripple without the ocean is inconceivable. Such is the strange position in which those in a world inhabited by bodies seem to be. Each body seems to house a separate mind, a disconnected thought, living alone and in no way joined to the thought by which it was created. Each tiny fragment seems to be self-contained, needing another for some things, but by no means totally dependent on its one creator for everything, needing the whole to give it any meaning, for by itself, it does mean nothing, nor has it any life apart and by itself. Like to the sun and the ocean, yourself continues, unmindful that this tiny part regards itself as you. It is not missing. It could not exist if it were separate nor would the whole be whole without it. It is not a separate kingdom ruled by an idea of separation from the rest, nor does a fence surround it, preventing it from joining with the rest and keeping it apart from its creator. This little aspect is no different from the whole, being continuous with it and at one with it. It leads no separate life because its life is the oneness in which its being was created. Do not accept this little fenced off aspect of yourself. The sun and ocean are nothing beside what you are. The sun beam sparkles only in the sunlight and the ripple dances as it rests upon the ocean. Yet in neither sun nor ocean is the power that rests in you. Would you remain within your tiny kingdom, a sorry king, a bitter ruler, of all that he surveys, who looks on nothing yet who would still die to defend it. This little self is not your kingdom. Arched high above it and surrounding it with love is the glorious whole, which offers all its happiness and deep content to every part. The little aspect that you think you set apart is no exception. Love knows no bodies and reaches to everything created like itself. Its total lack of limit is its meaning. It is completely impartial in its giving, encompassing only to preserve and keep complete what it would give. In your tiny kingdom, you have so little. Should it not then be there that you would call on love to enter? Look at the desert, dry and unproductive, scorched and joyless that makes up your little kingdom and realize the life and joy that love would bring to it from where it comes and where it would return with you. The thought of God surrounds your little kingdom, 
waiting at the barrier you built to come inside and shine upon the barren ground. See how life springs up everywhere. The desert becomes a garden, green and deep and quiet, offering rest to those who lost their way and wander in the dust. Give them a place of refuge, prepared by love for them, where once a desert was. And everyone you welcome will bring love with him from heaven for you. They enter one by one into this holy place, but they will not depart as they had come alone. The love they brought with them will stay with them as it will stay with you. And under its beneficence, your little garden will expand and reach out to everyone who thirsts for living water, but has grown too weary to go on alone. Go out and find them for they bring yourself with them and lead them gently to your quiet garden and receive their blessing there. So will it grow and stretch across the desert, leaving no lonely little kingdoms locked away from love and leaving you inside. And you will recognize yourself and see your little garden gently transformed into the kingdom of heaven with all the love of its creator shining upon it. The holy instant is your invitation to love to enter into your bleak and joyless kingdom and to transform it into a garden of peace and welcome. Love's answer is inevitable. It will come because you came without the body and interposed no barriers to interfere with its glad coming. In the holy instant, you asked of love only what it offers everyone, neither less nor more. Asking for everything, you will receive it and your shining self will lift the tiny aspect that you tried to hide from heaven straight to heaven. No part of love calls on the whole in vain. No son of God remains outside his fatherhood. Be sure of this. Love has entered your special relationship and entered fully at your weak request. You do not recognize that love has come because you have not yet let go of all the barriers you hold against your brother. And you and he will not be able to give love welcome separately. You could no more know God alone than he knows you without your brother. But together, you could no more be unaware of love than love could know you not or fail to recognize itself in you. You have reached the end of an ancient journey, not realizing yet that it is over. You're still worn and tired and the desert's dust still seems to cloud your eyes and keep you sightless. Yet he whom you welcomed has come to you and would welcome you. He has waited long to give you this. Receive it now of him, for he would have you know him. Only a little wall of dust still stands between you and your brother. Blow on it lightly and with happy laughter and it will fall away and walk into the garden love has prepared for both of you. <sighs> That's so beautiful. I love reading that section. I, that really gave me a great visual about you know, you and your ego self and, and the little bubble that you live in and you defend and you, and, um, and that there's so much more beyond the veil, beyond that, the confines of that bubble. Um, I found myself not paying attention to a whole lot after that part, because I just, I'm like, wow, that's a great, great analogy and a, and a great visual for, um, about how we restrict, um, how, about how strongly we defend what's within that bubble that we fail to recognize that our power is the infinite outside of that bubble. So I love that yeah. section. How strongly we defend the body, right? Because we think and it's how, real. Which is the bubble, really. Which I is mean, the bubble. It is yeah. the bubble. Or it's, yeah. it's part of the bubble because I think we have the, you know, the, the, the body is the bubble. But for me, it's almost like there's layers. We got the body bubble and then we've got 
the body and the external world as we see it with all these other little pieces in it, mm -hmm. which are other, other people, other things, other, whatever, yeah. but in the reality of the whole thing, it's all part of that oneness. And I love that, um, about how, you know, you take away the, the, that one tiny little spot of sun and the sunbeam is gone and there's no, there's no possibility of ever having mm -hmm. the teeniest little ripple if there is no ocean. And so yeah. again, that's a, just a really great way of looking at it to help you understand where each little, each, each piece is just as important to the whole as, as the next seemingly little piece it doesn't exist in the absence of the other pieces yeah hmm. great analogy i love it i love it because so many times we don't think of ourselves as the ripple right as this little thought uh in the mind of god or in the mind of the universe or whatever you want to call it right the mind of love we don't see ourselves as we are the mind of god just like the ripple doesn't see itself as I am the ocean, right? It sees itself as, as separate, which is you know similar to how we see ourselves as separate from that one mind of God. And we've built that little fence around it saying, this is me, I'm not this thing, I'm this little thing. But once you, once you let go of the body and the idea that you are a body, then you can more easily accept that idea that you are an idea in the mind of the one mind and just how great of a power that is, right? It's so much greater than the ripple of the ocean, so much greater than the, the beam of the sun. Like you're a thought in the mind of God, which is amazing. And you're, you already are, already are part of that kingdom of heaven. Any more conversations before we go to the next section, which is the last section in this chapter? And it's kind of long. So let's go ahead and I'll read that and then we'll have lots of time to discuss. The two worlds. All right, come on, computer, there you go. You have been told to bring the darkness to the light and guilt to holiness. And you have also been told that error must be corrected at its source. Therefore, it is the tiny part of, of yourself, the little thought that seems split off and separate the Holy Spirit needs. The rest is fully in God's keeping and needs no guide. Yet this wild and delusional thought needs help because in its delusions, it still thinks it is the son of God. Whole and omnipotent sole ruler of the kingdom it's set apart to tyrannize by madness into obedience and slavery. This little part you think you stole from heaven, get it back to heaven. Heaven has not lost it but you have lost sight of heaven. Let the Holy Spirit remove it from the withered kingdom in which you set it off, surrounded by darkness, guarded by attack and reinforced by hate. Within its barricades is still a tiny segment of the son of God, complete and holy, serene and unaware of what you think surrounds it. Be you not separate for the one who does surround it has brought union to you returning your little offering of darkness to the eternal light. How is this done? It is extremely simple, being based on what this little kingdom really is. The barren sands, the darkness, and the lifelessness are seen only through the body's eyes. Its bleak sight is distorted, and the messages it transmits to you who made it to limit your awareness are little and limited and so fragmented, they are meaningless. From the world of bodies made by insanity, insane messages seem to be returned to the mind that made it. And these messages bear witness to this world, pronouncing it as true. For you sent forth these messengers to bring this back to you. Everything these messages relay to you is quite external. There are no messages that speak for what lies underneath 
For it is not the body that could speak of this. Its eyes perceived it not. Its senses remain quite unaware of it. Its tongue cannot relay its messages. Yet God can bring you there if you are willing to follow the Holy Spirit through seeming terror, trusting him not to abandon you and leave you there. For it is not his purpose to frighten you, but only yours. You are severely tempted to abandon him at the outside ring of fear, but he would lead you safely through and far beyond. The circle of fear lies just below the level the body sees and seems to be the whole foundation on which the world is based. Here are all the illusions, all the twisted thoughts, all the insane attacks, the fury, the vengeance and betrayal that were made to keep the guilt in place so that the world could rise from it and keep it hidden. Its shadow rises to the surface, enough to hold its most external manifestations in darkness and to bring despair and loneliness to it and keep it joyless. Yet its intensity is veiled by its heavy coverings and kept apart from what was made to keep it hidden. The body cannot see this, for the body arose from this for its protection, which depends on keeping it not seen. The body's eyes will never look on it, yet they will see what it dictates. The body will remain guilt's messenger and will act as it directs as long as you believe that guilt is real. For the reality of guilt is the illusion that seems to make it heavy and opaque and impenetrable and a real foundation for the ego's thought system. Its thinness and transparency are not apparent until you see the light behind it. And then you see it as a fragile veil before the light. This heavy seeming barrier, this artificial floor that looks like rock, is like a bank of low dark clouds that seem to be a solid wall before the sun. Its impenetrable appearance is wholly an illusion. It gives way softly to the mountaintops that rise above it and has no power at all to hold back anyone willing to climb above it and see the sun. It is not strong enough to stop a button's fall, nor hold a feather. Nothing can rest upon it, for it is but an illusion of a foundation. Try but to touch it, and it disappears. Attempt to grasp it, and your hands hold nothing. Yet in this cloud bank, it is easy to see a whole world rising a solid mountain range, a lake, a city, all rise in your imagination. And from the clouds, the messengers of your perception return to you, assuring you that it is there. Figures stand out and move about, actions seem real, and forms appear and shift from loveliness to grotesque. And back and forth they go as long as you would play the game of children's make-believe. Yet, however long you play it, and regardless of how much imagination you bring to it, you do not confuse it with the world below, nor seek to make it real. So should it be with the dark clouds of guilt, no more impenetrable and no more substantial, you will not bruise yourself against them in traveling through. Let your guide teach you their unsubstantial nature as he leads you past them. For beneath them is a world of light whereon they cast no shadows. Their shadows lie upon the world beyond them, still further from the light. Yet from them to the light, their shadows cannot fall. This world of light, this circle of brightness, is the real world where guilt meets with forgiveness. Here the world outside is seen anew without the shadow of guilt upon it. Here are you forgiven, for here you have forgiven everyone. Here is the new perception where everything is bright and shining with innocence, washed in the waters of forgiveness and cleansed of every evil thought you laid upon it. Here there is no attack upon the son of God and you are welcome. Here is your innocence waiting to clothe you and protect you and make you ready for the final step in the journey inward. 
Here are the dark and heavy garments of guilt laid by and gently replaced by purity and love. Yet even forgiveness is not the end. Forgiveness does make lovely, but it does not create. It is the source of healing, but it is the messenger of love and not its source. Here you are led that God himself can take the final step unhindered. For here does nothing interfere with love, letting itself, let it, letting it be itself. A step beyond this holy place of forgiveness, a step still further inward, but the one you cannot take transports you to something completely different. Here is the source of light, nothing perceived, forgiven, or transformed, but merely known. This course will lead you to knowledge, but knowledge itself is still beyond the scope of our curriculum, nor is there any need for us to try to speak of what must forever lie beyond words. We need to remember only that whoever attains the real world beyond which learning cannot go, will go beyond it, but in a different way. Where learning ends, there God begins. For learning ends before him who is complete, where he begins, and where there is no end. It is not for us to dwell on what cannot be attained. There is too much to learn. The readiness for knowledge still must be attained. Love is not learned. Its meaning lies within itself. And learning ends when you have recognized all that it is not. That is the interference. That is what needs to be undone. Love is not learned because there never was a time in which you knew it not. Learning is useless in the presence of your creator, whose acknowledgement of you and yours of him so far transcend all learning that everything you learned is meaningless, replaced forever by the knowledge of love and its one meaning. Your relationship with your brother has been uprooted from the world of shadows and its unholy purpose has been safely brought through the barriers of guilt washed in, with forgiveness and set shining and firmly rooted in the world of light. From there, it calls to you to follow the course it took lifted high above the darkness and gently placed before the gates of heaven. The holy instant in which you and your brother were united is but the messenger of love, sent from beyond forgiveness to remind you of all that lies beyond it. Yet it is through forgiveness that it will be remembered. And when the memory of God has come to you in the holy place of forgiveness, you will remember nothing else and memory will be as useless as learning, for your only purpose will be creating. Yet this you cannot know until every perception has been cleansed and purified and finally removed forever. Forgiveness removes only the untrue, lifting the shadows from the world and carrying it safe and sure within its gentleness to the bright world of new and clean perception. There is your purpose now, and it is there that peace awaits you. Well, what do we think about that? Well, I had uh, a little, little chuckle there in the paragraph 14, where it says there in the first sentence there, it says, and memory will be as useless as learning for your only <laughs> purpose will be creating well for all those that are having memory difficulties <laughs> hasten to creation there you <laughs> go leave, leave the memory to something else you know, so anyway i have an expression now where did i hide this denise or whoever's around <laughs> and it's it's a little a little uh bite against the ego i think for like oh you just need to pay more attention oh, hey it's just another another reason to separate to beat on yourself i mean all of this is, is saying it. stop stop beating on yourself stop trying just 
go with it. I mean, do you think these birds around here are trying to sing? <laughs> That's beautiful, by the way. I'm really enjoying your your whole aesthetic there. Well, this is a this is a great time to be in Florida, <laughs> North Florida. Yeah. Try me in three months. I won't probably be out of here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway but yeah this is this is great it's it's bringing back the memories and i think it is doing this for a lot of us where we didn't try you know we just simply said ah hell with it i just i can't do this anymore and just you just give up that was the first really big one for me was just saying if it has to be like this i just as soon get it over with right now and i really me meant that and then light, a light literally filled my head and a direct communion with, I didn't know what it was, Holy Spirit, now I know, and ultimately God. Um, so that's what awaits us when we, we stop trying. Yeah, we give oh. up the body, right? Yeah, like, mm -hmm. oh. So. Anyway, going back to I need do nothing, right? And just finding that communion with that one mind of God in whatever way that works for you, right? Sitting in nature or yeah, going for a walk or going for a run or, you know, taking a shower and letting the water just pour down over your body and just letting go, completely letting go of the body. Yeah, I was. I, I had a good experience yesterday. We were at a state park on the, on the ocean, and uh, um, all the umbrellas were set up, and uh, lotions were slathered, and <laughs> yeah, the protective gear was on the, the children and their husbands and whatever. And and uh, and I looked at that scene, and I started making a little little display out in front of us between them and the water you know the flotsam and jetsam and the final topping was a small child's yellow shovel that had been blown way away from the ocean <laughs> and then my daughter took a picture but but it, of me and, and that and it, it was like the, before that though when everyone was there and i was standing before them and i thought well you know i could get a picture of this you know but hey so what it'd be just one more picture but instead i absorbed that where the love of this lady my wife and myself um you know through these bodies created these more bodies <laughs> that that is linked to all this love and you know and i was and i didn't say that i just i just tr tried to be out of the way as much as i could for that time so anyway it, it was a, it was a neat experience and now i've shared it with you <laughs> i haven't even yeah. told my wife so anyway it was neat so it's the, those little times that just really stand out and this time. Yeah. How about anyone else? Do you guys have any tips or tools for getting out of your own way of, and getting out of the perception of being in a body? The exercise of, of silence. That exercise of silence doesn't mean that you don't, you, you don't speak necessarily. But there are times when just that silence that he was saying that what's Tim, right? Is his name? No. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That silence that you that you did while you were there is what got you there and you were able to talk about it today. Yeah. You know I, I stopped, yeah. I just stopped but, trying to be the center of, you know. Well, oh. it's just I think that just sometimes in the silence we we I think it's where we have really silenced the ego. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, it's well said. I think Mary talked yeah. about it earlier, that gap, the, the place between thoughts, between words, just getting into the gap. I know um, Wayne Dyer had a, 
a really wonderful meditation to get into the gap. And I've shared it before. You can Google it. It's um, saying the Our Father, because most of us have that memorized or saying whatever it is that you have memorized. And then in between the words, you pause and get into the gap in be that space in between the words. So you'd say in your mind, our father, and then in your mind, you jump to the space between the words, our and father, just hold yourself there as long as you can before the next thought comes and then go to the next two words, father, who, and then jump into that space between those two words, like visually, mentally jump into that space and stay there until the next thought comes and then just keep doing that. And, and that's a really, I've done it before. It's a really wonderful mm. training and way to find that place between thoughts, the gap between words, just to get into that gap of no mind. Mm. Yeah, that's neat. Um, that reminds me, uh, Terry, that I was listening to a, a, a rebroadcast, whatever, of one of Wayne's um, little televised things. And and it was not long after the Challenger blew up. And I think all of us who were living then remembers where we were. Um, but, but he he had not heard he, you know, his busy life and running and running and running. Well, he gets just, I guess, just before we was going before this broadcast, somebody told him and, and he, he felt, he, he, being in tune, he said, he said to himself, he, he saw what was happening. He says, well, I was fine. I mean, they died hours ago and now I'm feeling bad about something that's already gone. They're out of their pain, da, 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 da. But, but we're going to keep this alive is basically my my paraphrasing and god that's what we do all the time oh i i missed the sale i could have saved all this money or <laughs> jeez it's so laughable <laughs> yeah good point actually found I, I don't know how many of you have seen the lion king but there's a there's a, a line in there where Simba the son is complaining and carrying on and and uh, Rafiki the uh, the witch doctor soothsayer whacks him in the head with the with his cane and he goes ouch what'd you do that for he goes don't worry about it it's in the past. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> that's funny <laughs> oh boy so I just shared that um, meditation um, in the chat group if you guys oh. want to take a look at it yeah I see there's a chat yeah yep. oops huh. All right, so we have a few more minutes. If anybody has anything else they want to talk about or share or pertaining to what we just read or any of the lessons or anything that's happening pertaining to just, the miracle. Hey, I haven't been, I've been listening on and off and um, throughout the, <laughs> this whole time that we're together. I've come on when I can and I was here for the full episode today and I just, um, Thank you for sharing that about Wayne Dyer. I haven't heard about that, but I really like that idea because I know I'm one who has a problem with um, sitting still and meditating in silence, but the idea of having a prayer that we're used to saying and being able to use that as, um, as a form of meditation, that's something I'm interested in giving a try. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Liz. Good to have you here today. All these mm. um, interesting ways to Come no mind, right? Get out of our thinking mind and into that place of one mind. Yeah. Mm. Great. Go ahead, well, what pages? Go ahead, Mary. What page? What pages were we just reading? Because I I find quite often that people say to me, 
The whole crux of the course is forgiveness. That's the whole message. And if you get that, you know, you're, and, and these, the pages that you read speak about forgiveness as being another tool. It's an important tool, but it is not like the end all. Right. It's just part of that domino effect that once you have the little willingness and you open yourself up to these things, it's just like, whoosh, and you get carried away in how everything folds into everything and everything because it is all one. And so that's the part of forgiveness that's significant, and yet there's, there's the beyond that. Yeah. So if you could tell me what pages you were reading, that would Page be helpful. 393 to 396. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Actually, 397. 393 to 397, and it was um, the mm. two worlds. Mm. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, and you know, it's funny because during that part, I, I read the part that says, and once you're, once you're at that place where you make yourself ready to just be love, then you're transported into this place that you will know you will be part of that one mind and have all knowledge, but you can't learn that. It's not for us to learn that. It's, it's, a, it's just, it's kind of like the wave can't know what the ocean is while it's still being a wave. You know what I mean? It's like the wave has to stop and, and know itself as the ocean. So it, I feel like, you know, that part of it is that once you get, once you make yourself ready by practicing forgiveness to be at this place of acceptance of just, of just, I shouldn't say just, of being love, then the next step is taken by the one mind of God, which is mm. your, your true essence, right? And, and at that point, is when you have that realization of being one with God and, and having that experience of complete at one man. But that's not for you to do. It's not for you to fix or, or do. Does anybody have any little um, suggestions for things that they think of in the moment if they've got an ache or a pain or they don't like how their clothes fit or whatever, where you you're, you go to uh, the body and then not liking the body. I've, I've experienced this a lot. It's interesting because my daughter's getting married in December. So there's so much about that. That's about the body and other bodies and how the body's looking, what they're wearing. And I got to look good in my mother, the bride dress. So I got to do this. And I find that it's difficult for me to, and especially, you know, you get in your sixties, things, you know, they ache a little or is it, there's a lot of things about the body that scream to you that the body's important when the body's not even real. So does anybody have any little thing when you kind of get caught up in, ugh, you know, the pain or, oh, geez, I wish I could lose five pounds. So then I, so I don't look like an ogre in this dress or whatever the thought is about the body that kind of nips that. So you can get back to what's real. So I, I like to practice um, self-love when I'm doing that, because I'm, I'm always not associating myself with what I am in truth, which is love, right? And anything you can do to practice self-love, which would be mirror work, where you could look in the mirror and just say, I love you, I love you, and, and say it until you actually mean it and you believe it, right? Because you can look in the mirror and you can look at your reflection and say, I love you. And the first thing your ego wants to say is, you're so full of crap. Right? Yeah, but there's always a yeah, but. <laughs> yep. And, but as you continue to practice self love and self nurturing and just having like almost like you're having a talk with yourself, like your higher self is having a coaching session with that part of you that's not feeling good enough or that's not feeling like you're whatever it is you're not feeling enough of, right? And just really sit yourself down and say, you know, I love you. You have done such a great job getting me to this point in my life. Look at all the work you've done to help yourself grow and expand and, and look at, you know, all of these things that you've put into nurturing your family and, and just having that like one-on-one -on -one conversation with yourself in front of a mirror so that you are having that dialogue. Like you've done a great job 
bringing this your daughter into the world look at how amazing you know you've done it at creating this love and and being so vigilant with your course in miracles studies to to learn and grow and accept yourself more in this loving way and, and just really have a, a good heart to heart with yourself yeah it's amazing how <laughs> when you do that work how deeply in doctor or how deeply ingrained um some of the thoughts about your body and, and your, like I was a competitive gymnast. I don't think there's any sport really that's as seriously body aware or body, body negative, body shaming. I, I know there's lots of them out there, but I do know gymnastics is in the top 10. And so mm -hmm. many of those concepts that I have about my value as a person, I mean, we could go way, way back. So it's interesting how even in the process of doing the work, and literally trying to, is it talk yourself into it or to convince yourself the truth of who you really, uh, the truth of who I really am as I look at that reflection, man, those inner, the deeply indoctrinated things, it's, it, it's yeah. always chirping in my ear. It's like, okay, shut up already. Um, it's a, it's quite a, quite a process and a 24 seven vigilance to get to that place where you're not acknowledged you're, or, or you are acknowledging that what you're hearing from your ego self is not true. Right. There's, there's no worse, that. there's no worse critic than ourselves to ourselves. Oh, yeah. That's oh, why absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we forgive ourselves. Say yeah. it to yourself. Louise, I forgive Louise. you for thinking this thing. Yeah. yeah. That's good and then, too. and then, and then as, as, as Terry was saying, you know, think about all the positive stuff. She's going to be now more, well taken care of she's going to have somebody that she comes to by being married now she's committed you know all the positive things you know never mind what i look like <laughs> i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna look worse as i go along no true forgive yeah that. forgive it forgive it you know and say this yeah. is a good thing work on all that all the that oh and happens. i do i i focus a I, lot on it but my focus on the positive is always about everybody else that part's easy yeah. for me it's when you, it just comes back to what you originally said, Ernesto, is that we are our own worst critics. So it's easy for me to find the positive in everything about everybody else. I'm just not on that list sometimes. Louise, then can you laugh at the critic? Can you laugh at the critic and just hear that stuff going on in your head, but ask yourself or look at yourself in the mirror as if you are God looking onto you, looking at this individuation of of perfection however it is and weighing like in in the scheme of things is this an important thing to worry about five pounds or or whatever it is but through unconditional love can you talk to yourself through unconditional love as if as if your daughter is standing looking in the mirror going i can't get married because i'm five times overweight and i won't look the way i'd love to look going down the aisle so i'm gonna post on insane. the wedding it, it's, so I look that way. Like, it's in it is yeah. uh it, yep i can acknowledge everything you're saying because it's utterly insane it is somebody it kept really trying is. to interject something about louise hay was that yeah. you liz I know it was me. Louise Hay has a lot of very powerful YouTube meditations and mantras that are all about self-love. And it, yeah. she's incredible. I mean, she's, uh, you know, obviously she's gone now, but her legacy lives on. And, and those helped me a lot when I was going through a very low time in my life. And it really helps you to learn how to be loving and compassionate towards yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very and I, I, said, I, I have glimpses. I, I honestly, I, I do. Um, I, I really do. So I thank everybody for their input on that. So I do have uh, periods where like, like I get it and I feel it. Right. And they're fleeting. So it's a work in progress, right? You just keep practice and practice. Practice, practice, practice. Yeah. yeah so I practice um, repetition. Alicia. Repetition. Okay. You have to look at yourself and say, I don't believe anything negative you're saying. Hmm. I don't yeah. believe it. I don't believe you. You know, uh, and then we're go close to, to the end. Go, and but then go Alicia, to the love. Go I would also love. add in that one of the things that um, I respectfully that Tim and Ernesto will never be able to uh, have a perspective in this particular lifestyle is that of a woman. As somebody who used to be very, very overweight, I lost a lot of weight very quickly. 
Um, and my body's never looked weirder. Like it just, it's never gonna look like a 20 something. I'm 36 at this point, but from the bottom of my heart, I've never felt more comfortable in this body. And so from one woman to another, I would also beg of you to plant those seeds of remembering that a lot of your success has been conditioned to you that it is your body. And even as you age, it doesn't matter how poignant and how miraculous the words coming out of your mouth are for people who are not growing, they still judge us by that body. So it's very natural that you're going to feel that way. You should know that you're gorgeous. You should know that you have amazing things to bring to this world. But I'm telling you, like these little bad arms, they're never going away. They're never going away, but I've never felt more powerful. So just like they said, your daughter is only going to be focusing on the fact that you are standing there next to her, showing her how to be a good wife going forward. And she won't care about that dress. So you shouldn't either. Well, thank you, Rachel. Appreciate Hallelujah. it. Hallelujah. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hopefully everyone has said their piece, but um, it's great to have all of you here today. I think we had some really powerful conversations. Just and look at the uh, lesson 198, only my condemnation injures me. And I just want to say, and as I read that, the wind blew the page to the next lesson, which says, I am not a body, I am free. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> little joke. Lesson, what is it, Tim? 198? 198 is only my condemnation. My condemnation Good. injures me. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. 198 and 199. Good lessons for all of us today yeah, based on what go. we were reading. <laughs> all right. Yes. Thanks again, everybody. We'll all see right, you next thanks. week. Thanks. Great to see you all. Bye. Thank you for joining. We will Bye, see everybody. you next week. Love you. Bye. Love you guys. Bye. Bye. You too. Bye.